thanks uh, Peter and participants to stay with us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much all for coming to be part of this parallel session of the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. I'd like to thank Julia and Natalia to be here to, to direct the meeting and also to take notes about what's going on in this meeting. It is about the value and the functionality of the soil biodiversity that we will discuss under the title Soil Biodiversity in Action. And we have a, a broad variety of uh, presentations ahead and I look very much forward to that. And the only thing I wanna say before I give the word to the first presenter is that we are quite strict in time. So we have uh, 15 minutes uh, per person, which is 10 minutes for the presentation. And then we have five minutes for questions and answers, which is very tight. And there's no break between two and four o'clock this afternoon. Now, to give you a little bit of rest, um, all the presentations will be available after the meeting. So you can have a second look on it if you wish. And the second thing I wanna say in, in advance is that it's very likely that we do not have enough time to have all the questions and all the answers, but you can use the chat. The chat is below your screen. So if you have a comment or a question, you can also use the chat. And the one who's giving the presentation, he can or she can look afterwards, look at the comments, look at the questions and come back to you. So we don't have to squeeze all the questions and the comments in the five minutes we have after a presentation. So in a way, uh, you can have all the questions and discussions you like. That's the advantage of a virtual meeting like this. Now, because we are also very strict in time, I don't want to waste much time with this kind of um, uh, information, but I would like to go uh, directly to the first presentation of this uh, afternoon. And this presentation will be given by Pascal Chouquet. And the title of this presentation is Termites Promote Resource Patchiness in Asia and Constitute a Model for Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Mr. Chouquet, the floor is yours. Yes. Good morning, good evening, um, good afternoon, depending where you are. So I guess you listen to me. You can listen to me? Yeah. Do you see my, do you see my screen? I, I shared my screen, but I don't know if it works. So... Hi, Mr. Jouquet. Uh, we cannot, we, we see black, uh, your screen. We see that you start sharing, but we don't see uh, the, the presentation. Okay. Can you try again? Um, it should work now, so maybe... Okay. If, nothing? Or... No, uh, I don't see anything. Please, uh, Peter, do you okay. see? Or... I, don't, I, I have a white screen. Okay. I don't see anything else. Natalia, can you see this? No, I can... cannot. But if you want, we can share it on your behalf. Yeah, we can share on your behalf. So uh, I will share it now. Okay. And you can just tell me next when I have to, when I have to uh, go from one slide to the other. Okay. Uh, try. No, it's not working. No? Still nothing. Still no, nothing. Still in black. Yeah. Okay. Boom. Okay, I will share I now up. for you. I give up, yeah, you can share it. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Do one second. Okay. Don't come that on my 10 minutes, huh, please. <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, or, or good evening, depending where you are. So, um, as you can see with this title, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, termites, and I try to show you in uh, 10 minutes how they can constitute an interesting model for achieving some of the sustainable development goals. So, next slide, please. Okay, so as you already know, uh, the soil system hosts a large diversity of uh, organisms 
living inside or on the ground, or on the soil, so below ground or above ground. Next slide, please. I think we have a problem. Julia, did we lose connection? Um, I don't know. I think that uh, Mr. Jouquet lost connection. Yes, I think so too. Okay. I think we can wait one minute if you manage to get back. Otherwise, we will pass to the second uh, presentation yes, and we'll, uh, okay. Then he can come in later in the if, session. Yes, exactly. Okay. No, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm here. I don't know what happened. But I, so I don't see your screen now. Okay. I'm afraid, I'm afraid it will be difficult. Huh? Uh, okay, so I will, I will share again your presentation, okay? Mr. Yes, Shuke? Okay. Yes. So I can keep talking. I want just to just to say that there are some organisms that that are living inside the soil, but uh, that uh, also to keep active on the ground while remaining uh, in the ground, build or use the soil to build a specific. No, it seems that there is a problem of connection. So we will uh, uh, try to solve this with Mr. Jouquet and we can go to the next presentation. What do you think? Uh, yes, I think if, if, if Samuel is, is ready to present his presentation, then I would propose Samuel that you are taking now the initiative. Samuel, is that okay with you? Can you unmute me, Julia? Uh, yes, you can unmute uh, yourself, Mr. Samuel, Samuel, now. Are you, are you uh, ready to take your presentation now? Because we first have to fix the connection with Dr. Shuke. I'm, I'm ready. Okay, we start with Samuel Franke now. So very nice, Samuel, that you're ready. Uh, the floor is yours. You will give a presentation on the management of humic covers and fungi biodiversity in forest soils. You can see my presentation. You can yes. perfect about the recorporization. Yes, okay. go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, my presentation is uh, the carbonization of soil with intensive uh, agriculture use in pine forests and the provision of fungal uh, ecosystem service. Uh, I will talk uh, about fungi on the forest, especially uh, agaricals, like Henidus suilius. And this is our Chilean experience. The managing uh, of humid cover is very important in forest uh, soil. In this way, uh, forest soils are recarbonized Initially, uh, conforming uh, to the fine branches, pine needles, and fungal ephi that make up uh, the leaf leader, we name uh, forest mulch. And in turn, contribute to the soil uh, biodiversity. For example, do you have uh, uh, humus more? Do you have uh, humus mother? And do you have also a uh, humus model? No? Humus model you can find by coniferous. Humus model uh, you can have uh, for latifolia, red leaves, 
and humus model uh, in both kinds of uh, forest. Normally, uh, by forest, uh, you can achieve range uh, from 20 to 40 ton hectare per year after soil sites uh, sequestrate organic carbon, which play a fundamental role in the nutrition and fertility of forest soil or abandoned soils or uh, intensive agriculture. Uh, you can see uh, the very typical uh, Humic form, mull, uh, mother, and, and uh, more. Uh, Humic form are, are very important in the geological activity uh, of soils. Um, 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 we have uh, 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 contribution in the relationship uniform of forest type, geological uh, activity, and uh, the relation uh, carbon and nitrogen. Also, you can have a uh, relation carbon phosphorus and carbon sulfur. But this is the influence of the formation of fungi uh, on the canopy of the cover, and also uh, climate uh, variables like rainfall regime, air temperature, wind speed, cloudiness, and humidity. Um, this is very... Also in, in pines, uh, the general pines, you can find also uh, mycorrhizal uh, association. Uh, especially in Pinus radiata plant, uh, we produce in, in our national nursery, all the plants are uh, inoculated uh, with mycorrhizal food, with the aim uh, that is the future forestry plantation uh, develop uh, this symbiotic relationship. The grow and development of this fungi is dynamic and the productivity of most from is determined by a multiple of environmental factors associated with clima, the organic uh, horizon, that is very important, the organic horizon on the soil, the human formation, the structure and manager of pine radiata forest. Uh, this kind of uh, edible mushroom produces in our country uh, by Silius lutus and Silius granulatus uh, is a very uh, important income uh, of fungal export. For example, this fungi uh, developed in the forest of radiata pine yield from 300 kilo hectare per year. When many people uh, in the communities live on this um, production. Uh, Sulius lutus, uh, we name uh, Boletus of pine, is at a constitute a mycorrhizal species of pine, mildly of uh, Venus radiata. You can see the, the picture of uh, Silius lutus, but in the humic form uh, more by radiata pine. We have also another uh, species, Silius granulatus, granulatus of pine. This is also a mycorrhizal species of pine. Uh, this fructification can be found in autumn season and in early winter. Silius granulatus uh, is, out, uh, is, a, is a mushroom. You can eat uh, very good. 
also, uh, if you make uh, soil and water conservation practice, you can affect the mycorrhizae and mushroom production. Especially if you, you make a management of fertility and soil biodiversity in forest soil, you can uh, increase uh, the production of uh, mushroom production. In this case, you have to manage the, the humic cover and you can affect in the biodiversity of flora and fauna on forest soil. If you uh, consider following variables, especially the provision of nutritional elements, base saturation, humus, porosity, cultural care, uh, of the forest. If you make all this practice, for example, uh, fertilization, uh, application of uh, calcium, uh, you can uh, accelerate uh, this, the decomposition of the uh, organic matter. If you make also management of the forest, you can have also uh, more luminous, more uh, luminity of the forest. Our experience in of sustainable management of forests and mushroom production, uh, do you need to have a multi-purpose management of the forest? Or well, that should consider it. Uh, the, in the initial density, a special uh, spatial distribution, and successive intervention of thinning and pruning to prevent the closing of glazes and maintain a luminosity percentage greater than 22%. For example, if, if you you begin with thousand tree pro hectare, if you make tree pruning, training, commercial training, and finally uh, you achieve four hundred uh, tree per, per hectare, in the final harvest uh, you can have a model to in increment uh, very high uh, production of mushroom um, on the forest. The conclusion is, uh, is, is, is important. The estimate of uh, carbon sequestration to consider the organic uh, horizon uh, and sub horizon because you can uh, sequestrate and fix it range between 22 and 42 ton hectare per year, which play a role, a fundamental role in the nutrition and fertility of forest. In this humic form, you can find ectomycorrhizic fungi does correspond to the species Sulius lutus and Sulius granulatus develop. The most important soil ecological factor does include the mycorrhizal and mushroom production is a, a good management of light intensity, temperature, the percentage of soil mass, moisture, fertility, and pH. By the multiple forest management uh, from the forestry point of view, it's very important the luminosity. And also to consider the forest mulch uh, or litter, you can have uh, a dip from 10 to 15 centimeters. And that's contributed to the protection of the soil and the proliferation proliferation of mushroom. A multiple use of forest management 
shall be contemplated in order to achieve the recarbonization of previous intensive agricultural soils through vegetative cover of guadiata pine or pine, you have to consider the density, the initial spatial distribution, the successive forest management with training and pruning, and also uh, the luminosity, luminosity is favored in such as to induce provision of fungal ecosystem service. The structure and temporal planning of uh, silvicultural uh, intervention are compatible with the production of edible fungi. Also, uh, we are researching now to evaluate the effect of soil conservation practice as, as selection of a species of broadleaf and shrubs, especially lupinus, through the application of soil and fauna strength. The improvement of mineralization and humidification condition through weight patching, calcium applicate, with basal application of low doses of magnesium and phosphorus according to the liter thick thickness and promote fertilization practice that do not excessive stimulation of humification and mineralization process of recarbonization process by building oxidative biotinuation of soils of flora and fauna. The main conclusion is that is the interaction of forests and soil biodiversity management, especially forest floor and intrinsic soil biodiversity, is very important for production of non-timber forestry product and are very relevant for food and income to the community. Many thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Franke. Uh, as you can see in the chat, uh, everybody can post his questions and comments by chat. They will be answered later by the presenters. Uh, according to my clock, we have just one or two minutes for a question. So if there's anyone who would like to pose a question now during the meeting, please raise your hand. Well, if not, again, questions can be posted on the chat and then we continue the session. And my question to Julia is, um, when do you like me to have uh, Professor Chouquet having his presentation? Uh, Peter, um, Professor Mr. Chouquet is trying to fix the connection issue that he has and he will try to share his presentation at the end of the session. Okay, at the end of the session. Yeah, at the end of the session. So we can go on with the next presenter. Okay, Thanks. Then, then, then it's an order to introduce the next presentation, <laughs> which will be given by Beata Hushkova. I hope I pronounced the name good, uh, Beata. And the title of the presentation is Good Agricultural Practices Help to Restore Sustainable biodiversity. Beata, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? I can okay. hear you. Okay. I try to share my screen, and if I will not be successful, please, if you can uh, share then uh, my presentation on your screen. I, of course, I will... no problem. Okay, I will try. Oh, I think I'm not successful, so please, if you can share my presentation, sorry for this. No problem. One second and I will share.
Okay. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. You can tell me, you can tell me next when okay. I should turn the page. And can you make it bigger or, or is okay like this? Okay, maybe it's okay. So dear colleagues, uh, I would like to present uh, part of our works, uh, which was done together with my colleagues, Rastislav Bušo and Jarmila Makovnikova. And uh, it is focused on, thank you, Good agricultural practices help to restore sustainable biodiversity. Next screen, please. At present time, uh, we can uh, we observe uh, climate changes, which has negative effect on several soil properties. Uh, mainly on soil moisture content, uh, which can uh, significantly decrease the productivity. And uh, one way how to fight against this uh, can be use of so-called good agricultural practices, uh, which has uh, huge influence on soil properties and uh, biodiversity. So objectives of our study have been focused on assessment of good agricultural practices like minimum till, mulch, no-till and organic farm type of soil cultivation. So in our study, we discovered a positive effect of such practices and uh, on the moisture content, uh, biodiversity, and also on soil structure stability. So next slide, please. We studied uh, soil properties on organic farm where soil is cultivated in a non-traditional way. The shape of fields are circles. And in the middle of each circle is one stand where the arm is uh, fixed. And uh, the arm is going to the circle and the uh, soil is cultivated in spirals. So one of these arm uh, is uh, 15 meters long and can be changed to another circle and so on. On this arm, you have spudding machine, and you can put also another type of uh, cultivation equipment, also uh, for uh, delivering the moisture to the soil. The soil is not plowed, so it's not turned. It's also only used. It's only used the spudding to cultivate the soil. Next, please. Here is. Uh, farmer who is patent holder of this type of soil cultivation and his arm is you can see the arm this 15 meters long arm part of part of it and uh, during cultivation you either can be there or it's not necessary your presence so you can do another things uh, what you want to do next please so on this farm, we checked the, we assessed the soil structure uh, as the stability of soil aggregates in water. We used Bakshayev seeding methods and we uh, checked the agronomically valuable soil structure, which is represented by aggregates of the size 0.5 to 3 millimeters and coefficient of soil structure, which is calculated from the amount of aggregates between 0 0.25 to 7 millimeters and divided by aggregates uh, bigger than 7 millimeters and lower than uh, 0 0.25 millimeters. Next, please. So here on, on this chart, you can see directly the positive influence of, of the um, soil cultivation on the organic farm. 
you can see the amount of uh, <clears throat> agronomy valuable structure is much higher, uh, mainly in deeper parts and on grassland and on the field uh, with conventional tillage, you can see a lower amount of, of agronomically valuable structure. What is mystery for us is a bit that uh, in grassland, the amount of valuable structure aggregates is quite low. Uh, in, the, uh, in the middle, you can see the depth 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 meters. Uh, so uh, this is the plowing layer. So is is uh, the influence of uh, uh, no plow is the the highest in this depth so you can see the highest difference between amount of these aggregates next please we checked also earthworms density uh, in soil monoliths uh, and uh, in the farm this uh, uh, in the organic farm uh, the earthworms, uh, like number of individuals, was much higher than in conventional farm. In uh, 2018, we didn't find any earthworms in the soil uh, with conventional cultivation. The same was also for biomass of earthworms. In 2018, it was zero because there was no earthworms present. So again, positive influence of organic farming and especially the fact that the soil is not uh, plowed and uh, that the soil is not contaminated because we discovered in another study that earthworms are practically not present in, in a soil which, which are contaminated by heavy metals, for example. Next, please. Uh, this uh, we studied also in a farm with uh, so-called good agricultural practices or soil saving practices uh, where uh, it was conventional cultivation compared with minimal uh, soil cultivation uh, like no-till, mulch and minimal application of soil cultivation. And again the same, uh, the earthworms uh, individuals and also bio in, uh, expressed in biomass were much higher in soil with uh, so-called good agricultural practices comparing to traditional cultivation. Uh, the highest amount was in a mulch application. Next, please. So this is this experimental farm in Borovce. So they are small fields divided and uh, there is using, uh, we use the different fertilizing and different uh, type of cultivation. Next, please. Uh, so we checked this minimum till mulch technology, no till and uh, control was conventional cultivation. Next slide, please. Uh, we checked microbial activity like CO2 productivity and dehydrogenase activity. Next, please. Uh, also humus content. The humus content was uh, the highest in soil with uh, good agricultural practices, mainly in no-till. Next, please. CO2 productivity also is uh, the highest in soils with uh, good agricultural practices, mainly in, in no-till and the lowest in uh, soil with uh, conventional cultivation. Next, please. Uh, so here is the dehydrogenase activity. 
uh, which uh, is uh, again the highest in uh, no teal and uh, or in the topsoil and in uh, the depth of 10 to 30 centimeters in is the highest in the minimum technology so type of soil cultivation but this is also because the humus content uh, in this layer is the highest in the minimum uh, technology type of soil cultivation. Next, please. Yield, uh, you can see briefly the yield. And I, I have to tell that not always the yield is the highest uh, in the soil cultivated in this uh, good agricultural practices system but uh, we have to tell that uh, it uh, we expect that it will improve by by years and also we have to take into consideration that not only the yield is the most important but we have to consider soil as part of environment and uh, uh, applying good agricultural practices uh, like no-till, minimum till, uh, mulch or organic farming uh, can improve the sustainability of soil properties and can improve the soil balance with the other part of environment. So not always the yield is the most important. Of course, if there would be uh, dramatical change in yield, then uh, yes, it is uh, it is not good. But uh, yes, here especially for spring barley and uh, uh, corn, the yield was lower and the highest was in uh, conventional cultivation. But it was not so dramatic uh, dramatic uh, difference. Next, please. Uh, good agricultural practices. Uh, uh can conserve and restore soil properties uh, soil biodiversity is crucial for soil properties improvement and uh, also soil structure is uh, very essential and uh, to improve soil structure is uh, quite a long process and it's not so easy like for example if you have compacted soil you can remove high bulk density very quickly with deep loosening and so on, so on. But improvement of soil structure is complex and is not possible to do it without uh, biodiversity, soil biodiversity increase. And uh, the last, uh, so thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Okonga. Um, I'm afraid we ran out a little bit of time. But as you all know that you have the Sorry option. for speaking so, so slowly. <laughs> okay, no problem. But uh, everybody knows that if there are any questions, and I thought there were already someone coming in to you, you can look at the questions, give answer later. So everybody who has a question for Professor Hofskova, please use the chat. And uh, because of time, we have now directly to continue to the next presentation, Thank which you. will be given by Professor Raul Ortega. And the title of this presentation will be Intercrop Management as a Tool to Increase Microbial Diversity on Rain Fed Almond Cultivating. Professor Ortega, the yes. floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to, to try to share my, my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay, fine. So the title of this work is Intercrop Management as a Tool to Increase Soil and Microbial Diversity on Rain-Fed Almond Cultivations. This uh, work formed part of the project Diver Farming, it's a, a crop diversification and low input farming across Europe 
And this project has an important number of field case studies, 23 in seven different countries of the European Union, representing different agronomical, environmental, climatic, uh, edaphic, and cultural characteristics. The University of Almería in Spain is participating in this project through the Soil Microbiological Lab, of which I am the, the leader. Okay, the uh, European Research Project Diver Farming aims to develop and test different diversified cropping systems under low input practices to increase land productivity and crop quality. In general terms, uh, intensification of agriculture has led to monoculture systems, intense, intense tillage, and an excessive use of pesticides and input for fertilization. This provoke serious problems such as loss of organic material, soil or erosion, loss of biodiversity, etc. The final results are a low efficient use of natural resources and the sustainability of the agrosystem is in risk. So that's why it is of great interest to adopt agronomic models based on diversified cropping system. In this study, we have focused in one intercrop system. We selected as case study, an almond tree intercropping system of rain fed almond. And we selected three uh, different management practice, one of almond alone, one an intercrop of almond with vineyard, and one uh, intercrop of almond with wheat. Uh, on uh, these crops are on the Almanzora base, basin, close to the Oria town in the northern province, in the northern part of the province of Almeria in Spain. The Almanzora basin is a new gene basin with material deposited during the Miocene and Pliocene with a diverse composition of materials. This is a Mediterranean landscape with semi-arid cli climate and hot summer, which coincides with the driest month. There is a summer drought in the area and mild winters. The scarcity of water and cool temperatures in winter make rain-fed crops important in the area. And especially important is the almond tree, being the second Spanish province with the largest area devoted to this crop. However, the hard climate conditions and results in low uh, yields, around 150 kilograms per hectare, compared with the Spanish average production of 500 kilograms per hectare. These marginal yields favor the abandonment of crops. This does exacerbated by some policies of the common agricultural policy. For example, different crops cannot be used to qualify for European agricultural subsidies or some cover is admitted, but not for productive species. This territory is defined in the geographical framework of the European Union as an environmentally and economically disadvantaged area and the abandonment of crops uh, can cause serious problems of erosion and loss of biodiversity. So our objective in this work is to know if soils under intercropping system increase the soil biodiversity of fungi in the semi-arid area uh, of the Almanzora Basin in the northern province of Almeria, Spain. Okay, so uh, we selected three different management practice, almond tree, and almond with a vineyard in intercrop, and almond with wheat. Here in this picture, we cannot see the, the wheat because it had already been harvested be, before. Okay. Our data are based on metagenomic analysis. We extracted the DNA of the fungi with the Archaea gen commercial kit and later we sequence this DNA with the uh, MISEC Illumina platform. Amplicons uh, were uh, 
compared against the United ITS database. The bioinformatic analysis were performed with the software Chain2, and we obtained taxonomic and data and several diversity indices. The statistical analysis include Permanova to check for significant difference between the communities among the communities of the different management system and LDA effect size test. So as we can see, there were clear uh, significant differences for the on the three different crop system uh, studied. And about the alpha diversities, intercropping system so with higher diversity values being the combination of almond and wheat, the one with the highest values for all the indices study. With the LESI analysis, we also identified uh, those types are more associated to the different crop practices. And again, we can see here in the red uh, columns that there are more taxa related to the uh, almond and wheat uh, intercrop uh, management system. Here are some examples of those um, taxa uh, related to this uh, system, management system of almond and wheat. Like, for example, uh, Didimela, SPP, Cladisporium, Cladospiroides, Cetacladium, SPP and Paraboremia selaginada. This uh, taxa were all the present or more present in this intercrop system, almond and wheat. So uh, other authors found that higher abundance and diversity in intercrop system, which is in accordance with our results. Besides, we found a diversity gradient among the different crop system almond and wheat uh, intercrop system was more diverse than almond uh, with vineyard, and these two were more diverse than almond uh, alone in the composition of the fungi uh, communities. We also found that there are different taxa related to the different crop systems. This uh, suggests that each combination of crops can favor certain taxa, which in turn can have important implications in the development of more sustainable crop system. The previous is of great interest as several studies have shown the effect of fungal diversity on plant productivity. Our conclusions were that the introduction of vineyard or wheat in almond tree cultivation produced differences in fungi microbial communities and an increase in the fungal diversity, being the almond with wheat combination the more diverse. Different taxa were more associated with each crop system, being the combination almond with wheat, the one with the highest number of taxa related. And this study can result in a start point for further research on the interaction of microorganisms, plants associated to crops, and the effects of intercropping in increasing the soil biodiversity. And thank you for uh, your attention. I hope I'm on time. <laughs> yes, Professor Ortega, you are perfectly on time. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. In fact, um, of course, we know we can post our questions on the chat, but we have a little bit of time for a question. So if, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to raise a question right now, Please raise your hand and you will have the floor. Peter, I think we can try again with Pascal to see if he can share his, yes. his presentation. If, if everyone does his questions on the chat, then we can retry the presentation of Professor Choquet. Are you ready, Professor Choquet? Yeah. Yes, but I'm really afraid to lose again the connection. So I, I'd like uh, if you can share the screen for me or the presentation for me, that would be much more appreciated. Yes, I, okay, I will. Thank you. And I will stop also the camera. So, okay. yes. The floor is yours, Professor Chopin. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's cross our fingers that it works.
So yeah, we we well quickly maybe before. So um, I was uh, so I said that in fact this presentation is um, is about uh, termites, and maybe that uh, one way to to understand how uh, important are these uh, organisms, it's to to compare them with the others. So maybe uh, next uh, slide. Uh, as you already know, the soil uh, hosts a large diversity of organisms living inside or uh, on the soil, uh, so below ground or above ground. But there are also some organisms, so next slide, yes. That, yeah, next, yes, thank you. <laughs> that have also developed a very interesting strategy. They are living inside the soil, but to stay active on the ground while remaining in the ground, use the soil to build some very uh, peculiar, very uh, different and specific uh, properties or, or soil structures. Uh, and here are some representation of, uh, of uh, this type of constructions. And that's the termite way of life, which are uh, building above ground constructions, so the mounds or the sheetings, in order to protect them from the environment. So next slide. And what's really interesting is that this construction have a huge impact on several key uh, ecological functions. And these are different spatial and temporal scales. So they can impact the mineralogy of clay, impact the biological, physical, and chemical properties of soil aggregates. They can uh, produce tunnels and chambers inside the soil and accumulate soil on the ground to produce sheetings and mounds. And these mounds at the largest scale constitute uh, or uh, shape the distribution of the nutrients at the landscape scale. And these are different scales, so they will impact uh, key ecological functions associated to the dynamics of soil and water, the sequestration of carbon, the regulation of biodiversity from microbes to plants, and of course, the soil fertility. Next slide, please. And, and that's typically what can be seen in Asia, and more specifically in this area, the lower Mekong Basin, where huge uh, termite uh, mounds uh, covered by trees can be seen in a rather uniform environment, the paddy fields. Next slide. So these mounds are made of soil uh, collected from below ground, from the deeper soil layers by termites, and brought to the surface, um, uh, so above ground. And because of this biological activity, uh, these termite mounds are usually enriched in, in uh, soil organic matter, so carbon, nitrogen, but also clay and cations, making these mounds uh, like island or patches of fertility at the farm or at the landscape scale. Next slide. What's also uh, very interesting is that uh, these termite mounds, and therefore this termite activity, provide uh, plenty of ecosystem services. First, they contribute to the regulation of biodiversity. So uh, for instance, in these results, we see that uh, biodiversity is very low, of course, in paddy fields with uh, only three individuals found here in this study against 27 found in termite mounds and without counting the plants, the crabs, the snakes, and, and the plants, yeah, uh, uh, and mushrooms available on termite mounds. Second, this uh, higher uh, content in uh, carbon, in nitrogen, in clay, cations, increase the fertility of the soil. And this explains why the farmers commonly uh, use that soil as amendment for increasing the fertility of their land. Next slide, please. In terms of food diversity and security, termite mounds are also very useful um, because they are used to grow different plants than rice. They can be used to grow different kinds of vegetables. And here, for example, pumpkin on the picture on the, on the left, on the top left. And um, uh, different kinds of uh, plants and insects and mushrooms can also be found on termite mounds. And those are uh, edible and can be consumed by the population, by the villagers. Some plants found on termite mounds also have medicinal properties and can be used to treat certain diseases on our symptoms. Another interesting example is shown on the right with the uh, cultural goods. That's clearly an aspect that uh, is probably, uh, uh, no, no, please, please come back. Yep. Yes, just come back, you've been too fast. Yes, thank you. So um, uh, yeah, we, we have indeed very interesting interactions between termites and local beliefs. Uh, for example, with this termite mound being built on a stupa uh, within a pagoda, 
or, or below uh, a stale with uh, probably representing Buddha at the foot of a termite mount. So next slide. So in brief, we yes, we we saw that termite mounts can positively impact uh, plenty of ecosystem services, and therefore some of the sustainable development goals, and especially the the SDGs uh, number fifteen and thirteen for the preservation of biodiversity, but also the sequestration of carbon in an environment well known for its emission of uh, of, uh, of carbon, of greenhouse gases. Um, we saw that uh, because they impact positively the soil fertility, they are likely also to increase rice growth and its resistance to uh, environmental uh, hazards such as droughts and pests. And, and all of that is likely to have positive uh, social economic impact and, and then to impact positively the SDGs number one, two, three, and eight. And finally, because the question of the quantification of the services provided by termites and more specifically by termite mounts, is not only important in the lower Mekong, uh, but uh, local, lower uh, Mekong Basin, but also in India or in Africa or in South America, maybe. So uh, we can even say that termites contribute to the SDG number 17, the partnership for the goal. And this presentation is a good example because it involves scientists from Cambodia, Djibouti, but also Thailand, India, and, and France. Next slide, please. Despite the fact that this termite mount provides uh, many ecosystem services, uh, this chart shows that their density is highly variable, from about 14 in a natural environment in India to less than one in Thailand uh, nowadays. And what's interesting here is also that uh, if we plot so this uh, density to, in, um, according to the GDP of the locations or country, we arrive to a very interesting um, representation or, or chart which suggests two things. First, that the better or the higher is the economy, and the lower will be termite mounts, and then that the less, uh, and perhaps that the less people are dependent or use these services provided by termite mounts. And, uh, and also that uh, because um, most of the agriculture is made from conventional agricultural practices, uh, we can even suggest that the higher uh, or that um, uh, termite mounts are clearly threatened by um, conventional agricultural practices. So we can suggest two scenarios. Uh, next slide or push, please. Yes. So two scenarios. Uh, a first, can you push again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So our first one, so a, a, a sad scenario in, in red. Uh, based on the growth of the economy associated with uh, intensive cultivation practices uh, that would lead to the disappearance of termite mounts and therefore on all the services they can provide to the society. Or, next uh, slide, or a green scenario based on the growth of the economy but associated, associated to, uh, to the development of diversified agroecological practices uh, using uh, the services provided by termite mounts. And then we can either imagine uh, the maintenance of uh, termite mounts density or an increase in abundance. But the problem here is that the loss of termite mounts is likely to be irre irreversible uh, without substantial efforts because dozens of years are clearly needed uh, in order to get termite mounts um, yeah, on, on the ground. And raising then the, the, the importance of um, to preserve and to protect this very peculiar environment. And, and one way to do that is perhaps to finally to better understand and quantify all the services I've uh, talked about, or perhaps others that remain to be discovered. And this before, of course, it's too late. So thank you. Can you just, yeah, next. And I would like just to, to thank all my colleagues who participated to, to that uh, work and, uh, and yeah, this study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schuke. It's very nice to see that uh, we indeed succeeded in having your presentation. It all went very smoothly. Uh, I was impressed by your results, very dramatic decays and termite mounts. Um, but we ran a, ran a little bit out of time. Uh, I can see that there is already discussion starting on the chat. And I would like to propose that if there are any questions or comments 
to Professor Joquet, please use the chat and you will can have answers soon or after the meeting so that we now can uh, continue with the session with the next presentation. Is that okay with you, Shilia? Then the next presentation will be given by- Yes, uh, uh, Oksana is uh, now a co-host, so she can- we can, we can just continue now. Again, thank you very much, Professor Choquet. We continue now with the presentation by Mrs. Naidonova. I hope I pronounce your name correct from Ukraine. And the title of your presentation will be Recovery of Soil Biodiversity on Reclaimed Drilling Paths of Soil Gas Wells in the East Ukraine. This is Naidjova. Please, the floor is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, please, please um, present your screen. So full, uh, full size, if you can. Okay, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, my talk will be in three parts. My co-author, Alena Drost and Dmitry Dyadin studied the physical and chemical property of soil. I studied the state of microbial, uh, microbial stenosis. And Irina Lezhenina and Nina Polchaninova studied the biodiversity of soil in vertebrates. Some statistical date. The total number of oil and gas fields in Ukraine is uh, 350. Average number of boreholes in one oil gas and gas field is about 30 of 40. Area of disturbed soil on one borehole in from five to 15 hectares. The natural soil are mainly chernozem, ordinary chernozem. The purpose of our study is to access to assess the influence of technical reclamation on soil biodiversity, microorganisms, and invertebrates, and estimate its recovery rate. We studied uh, reclaimed background soil on drilling pad in southern part of eastern oil gas bearing basin of Ukraine. Term of soil reclamation were different. Uh, this slide shows a location of soil sampling points on borehole site. As you can see in the picture, the area of uh, drilling site of borehole uh, 23 is contaminated. White streak in the image indicates contamination from drilling fluid components. We used uh, the classical method of soil microbiology. This is a method of cultivation on dense nutrient media. Uh, on this slide, you can see photos um, of petri dishes uh, with colonies of microorganisms on uh, soil, uh, on uh, solid uh, selective nutri nutrient media. Organic nitrogen assimilating bacteria on meat pepton agar, mineral nitrogen assimilating bacteria and actinomycetes on starch ammonia agar, fungi on Richter media, oligotroph on starvation agar, azotobacter on HB media. Soil invertebrates were collected by soil excavation. 20 samples were taken at each reclaimed and control plots. The invertebrates found in each sample were identified uh, in laboratory condition. You can see zones of elevated compaction in uh, 0 to 30 centimeters lace at the borehole mouth. In the 30 to 60 centimeter lace, soil penetration resistance was much higher. 
In the center of the pad, you can see a strongly compacted zone. Obviously, this was a center of the most active movement of heavy vehicle and drilling equipment. The soil has uh, elevated concentration of heavy metals, especially barium and uh, lead, derived from drilling fluids. The highest concentration of them was detected in the center of the former drilling pad. On the reclaimed three years ago site, soil compaction values were less. On the site reclaimed one and three years ago, density of topsoil correspond to moderate and low level of agrophysical degradation. The density of soil reclaimed seven years ago was, is, was the same at the background site. Heavy metals concentration for this site was most similar uh, uh, to reclaimed and background soils site. Uh, it's my part of, of the study. Uh, recently reclaimed soil uh, had much lower number of microorganisms comparing to background values. Uh, in the claim uh, 35 years ago soil, uh, microorganism number for all studies group was uh, significantly lower than in background soil. Reduced number of microflora here is a consequence of soil pollution. Uh, the number of microorganisms in uh, soil borehole number 103, which reclaimed three years ago. Uh, did not uh, deviate in, in favorable direction from background values, except for, except for axinomycetes. Uh, their number were twice lower in the reclaimed soil. No negative uh, difference in microorganism number was found on the site reclaimed seven years ago. So the degree of uh, microbial communities uh, disturbance depends on the age of technical reclamation and the duration of the biological stage of reclamation, as well as uh, on the presence or absence um, of, of soil pollution. The degree of uh, deviation, the number of microorganisms in recently reclaimed soil and in soil reclaimed 35 years ago corresponds to a moderate level of biological degradation. Soil plots in other boreholes are not degraded. So the number of microorganisms in the reclaimed soil is restored to the level of the background soil in three years. At the study site, invertebrates of four classes were considered. The family Enchetriida was the richest in individual uh, numbers. In the first post reclamation year, the soil was nearly empty. Even at the third year after disturbance, the invertebrate density was much lower than at the control sites. It has recovered by the seven years due to the high enchetrate number. The first inhabitants of, of reclaimed soil are the larvae of uh, phytophagus beetles. The lumbricid recolonized uh, the soil very slowly. The invertebrate alpha diversity was extremely low in the first year after disturbance and recovered in the seventh one. The lumbris, uh, the lumbricid recolonized the soil very slowly. And in conclusion, microbiological and zoological indicator of reclaimed soil condition depend of quality of soil reclamation and duration of residual effect of soil disturbance. Uh, 
uh, technical storage of land reclamation has a detrimental effect on the soil biota. Number of soil mi microorganisms and invertebrate fauna has positively correlated with soil humidity and negative correlate with soil compaction and heavy metal concentration. Recolonization of disturbed soil begins in the second year by the larvae of phytophagous insects. The biodiversity recovery is slow and uh, approaching initial values after seven years of reclamation. The earthworms are most vulnerable. The oligarchic worms, lumbricid and chytrid, uh, are recommended in indicators of the soil reclamation adequacy. And in conclusion, I would like to emphasize the important role of biological indicators of the soil quality and soil health. Um, microbiological and zoological indicators reflect the agroecological status of the reclaimed soil and should be applied during the soil monitoring at oil and gas production site. They are particularly informative of state of contamination, rate of restoration, and efficiency of measurement for improvement. Thank you for your attention and patience. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nadjurnova. Uh, thank you also very much for so nicely in time, but I was also impressed by your results. I think I've never seen such a huge differences between uh, reclamation stage and uh, the, the amount and the diversity of soil organisms. So very impressive. Uh, I hope there will be questions and comments to you. So again, for all the participants, please use the chat. You can ask your questions to Ms. Nainova. Uh, as long as this presentation holds, you can have answers almost directly or after the meeting. And the presentations will also be available to all of you through our website. Uh, then uh, we go to the next uh, presentation of this afternoon, uh, which is something uh, else. We go to urban environments. The presentation will be given by Mrs. Kathleen Schlafeitsch. And the title of her presentation will be Urban Soil Biodiversity, a Multi-City Comparison. Mrs. Schlafeitsch, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hear somebody in the background. Um, okay. Yeah, solved. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a topic that's rarely discussed in terms of uh, soy biodiversity issues, and that is urban uh, biodiversity. And usually this topic comes um, into discussion because we consider uh, urban systems or urbanization uh, um, to be a major cause uh, to biodiversity loss and disturbance and uh, soil disturbance. Uh, but today I would like to talk about why we actually need to still study uh, urban systems and urban biodiversity. And, um, uh, and it's very important, not just for soil health as well as, but also for human health. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. This is an international um, effort. We have been studying urban soil uh, organisms for many years, and this particular talk is about one um, uh, aspect of this study that I'm going to present today. But um, here we have uh, experts, taxonomic experts, students, uh, soil ecologists from different parts of the world. 
So uh, why study urban environments to begin with? Well, there's a number of reasons why we should be doing that. Obviously, even the soils are extremely disturbed. They still have organisms living in them. And I would like to just point to the last two bullet points here. Um, essentially, um, these organisms do perform or provide the same or similar ecosystem services. And also this uh, majority of the human population that lives now in cities, um, a lot of the, the residents, they don't go out to the wilderness to you know, reconnect with nature. For many of them, uh, the main experience with nature, plants and animals comes from within the city, their experience of, uh, in different urban green spaces that includes parks or their own backyards, their gardens, uh, schoolyards and so on. So um, the, um, motivated by this fact, um, we started um, a network called the Global Urban Soil Ecology and Education Network. And so our main objectives in this case was to essentially study urban systems, urban soil systems, um, and also while doing so develop protocols that are easy to uh, adopt in different places of the world and also can involve citizen scientists. So main science questions, obviously one of the interesting uh, ecological questions of that with all these uh, disturbance and soil movements, we actually create new systems. You, we bring together species that are not um, uh, evolving together or not developing together, how they, what their interactions are. And when we study urban uh, ecosystems, you know, the fundamental question is always about the relative importance of natural drivers versus what we call anthropogenic drivers. In this case, in terms of how they affect soil development, how they affect soil community assembly. And of course, cities are the most, um, uh, the systems that are most profoundly impacted by human activities, uh, management, disturbance, and they're continuously uh, being impacted by humans. And these impacts, of course, are also affected by uh, political, social, cultural, economical factors. So the, the social component in an urban system is extremely strong. And the, the part that I would like to talk to today about is how um, this continuous human impact in different parts of the world does it uh, result in similar uh, properties, soil biological, um, physical, chemical, and biological properties. So essentially what we do here is we testing what's called the urban ecosystem convergence hypothesis. And that's basically what it says is that we can take an ecosystem property, in this case, a soil property, pH or soil organic matter. And if we look at on a global scale on natural systems, let's call them reference sites, we have a huge range of these of, of this given property. But over time, uh, mostly because of how humans shape their environment, these ranges will shrink uh, and become smaller. And so the conditions become a lot more similar. Uh, one general sort of uh, feature of the urban landscape, of course, is its extreme heterogeneity. We can look at an urban system with the bird's eye view and we immediately see different types of land uses, land covers, and they form a patchwork of these different uh, land use types. But also we can look below ground and we also see that our soils in an urban system changes from sort of naturally available or naturally present soil with a natural horizonation and, and soil biota with completely engineered soils which were put together by people for some purpose. So out of this um, matrix, which is based upon degrees of disturbance and management, we have chosen three, what uh, we, I'm, I'm going to call remnant, turf grass, ruderal, and adding to this a reference, which represents the, the, the biome and the climatic region and the natural soil in a certain parts of the world. And so we have been comparing these four what we call habitat types, reference, remnant, turfs, and ruderal. I will keep saying that. Each of these habitat types will replicate it five times in each city. 
And so we conducted our observations and experiments in five cities uh, uh, located on three continents. And so the point in this case is that we done everything uh, the same way, uh, the experimental setup, the sampling and the analysis. And the data we were collecting were just basic soil data on pH, carbon, and nutrients, and so on. Uh, for biology, we looked at microbial community composition and earthworms. And for function, we were using uh, tea bags, which are now nowadays are sort of more frequently used as a proxy to uh, follow decomposition and thus biological activity. So first, uh, abiotic data. So remember what we were saying is that in reference size, natural size, the values, the global range is higher, in urban size, they're lower. So if we consider these four habitat types, you know, being essentially on a disturbance gradient, so this is more natural and this is definitely very highly disturbed, um, we expect that uh, these, what we've used for looking at variation, global variation is coefficient of variation. So coefficient of variation is, is decreasing. That means the things are becoming more similar. So for soy pH, we have the five cities here. The, the red circles are the more natural sites, remnant and reference. The uh, green circles are more sort of human, hum, human created habitats, turf and very um, disturbed soil. And so what we see is that regardless of the initial values, pH is increasing along this gradient. And um, CV coefficient of variation is decreasing, indicating convergence. Similarly, the same thing for soil organic matter. So again, even though the initial, the natural conditions are very different, um, essentially the direction or the trends are the same with the exception of South Africa. Uh, this side, obviously the natural uh, system is a, um, uh, a grassland and so it, which had a very low soil organic matter naturally content. So again, uh, we, we saw convergence in this case. For microbes, uh, we see variation decreasing for um, archaea and then fungi, but not for bacteria. And uh, another sort of general feature was that as we were moving towards more disturbed, more open sites, ammonia oxidizers were increasing. So coming from microbes to macrofauna, earthworms obviously are extremely important, except when they don't uh, occur, and then termites will become extremely important keystone group, affecting just about everything about soil properties. So earthworms are very successful components of urban soil fauna, and partially because they can move um, easily within the soil. And out of the earthworms that we at least know today, about 80 of them, which are what we call peregrine earthworms, they live very close to, and they do very well in human environments. And some of these are indicated here um, that um, have names. So there's two questions. What uh, we had two basic questions with the earthworm communities. One is a city sales, city scale question. Do earthworm communities uh, overlap uh, on these different uh, habitat types, reference, remnant, turf, and rural. And so the answer to that was different depending on the city you looked at. So for instance, in Helsinki, the fact that these little uh, polygons do not overlap indicates that they have distinct earthworm communities. Whereas in Baltimore, where I live, this overlap indicates that the earthworm communities were very similar. Now we can ask the same very questions on a regional or global scale. And now the question is how similar these earthworm faunas are to each other, but also to their um, respective, what we call regional species pool. So we're comparing local diversity, alpha diversity to gamma diversity, but also we're comparing the different cities among um, each other. So what we found in this case is that uh, indeed there was a higher degree of similarity regardless of which continent they were uh, among the cities than 
each city to their respective regional species pool. And so this is uh, a phenomenon often referred to as biotic homogenization. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, the mechanism to actually leading to these great degrees of similarity is very different in different localities. So the story is different, the result is the same. Okay, so for microarthropods, moving from micro to mesofauna, microarthropods, fundamentally uh, springtails and mites, showed very, on the other hand, very distinct uh, co communities. Hello? You have one minute. One minute. Okay, communities. Um, um, both in terms of abundance, there was a lot more in reference remnant than in, and also in species composition. So the three uh, reference remnant forests uh, have distinct communities from uh, the more open habitat. So another successful group in cities are isopods, where they are often dominate pitfall trap materials. They can become pests, in which case eco ecological or ecosystem service become ecosystem disservice. Do we lose a connection or? I think yes, unfortunately. I didn't do that. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Mr. Ka Ms. Catalin? Ms. Catalin, can you hear us? No. Okay. I will give cost to next speaker. Yes, I, according, to, according to the summary, we were close to ending this presentation anyway. So I think be, also because we lost connection, please have your questions on the chat. And we can now continue with the next presentation, which is by Professor Emrias Betamariam. And the title of the presentation will be Abuscular Mycorrhizal Fungal Abundance in Dry Afro-Montane Forests in Northern Ethiopia. Are you available? Yes, I'm available. Can okay. you see my screen? Thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Can you see my screen? I hope so. Not yet. Okay, try to share your screen again. Uh, if you cannot, I will share for you and you will tell me next when I have to go from one slide to the other. Yeah, okay, let me do that. How about now? Mm, no. Not really. Okay, you can you can shoot from your end. No problem. Yes. Okay. And I can see it from my end. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. This is uh, uh, Ermias Betamariam. I'm, I'm presenting from the World Agroforestry ICRAF, Nairobi, and then I'm working for both uh, C4 and ICRAF. And then my presentation is, you know, it takes you a little bit of on the forest landscapes. And then I would like to really summarize what we found on two papers. And then I don't want to go to detail into the methods and then things we followed because I will share the links to the two papers for audience to read. And then I would really say, I'll try to save time for discussion. Next slide, please. Yes, I think as a context, I think all of you might already know, I don't want to preach you again, the values of uh, Abakura mycorrhiza fungi in this case, I think they are playing a very critical, you know, ecosystem functions for the multiple ecosystem services we are uh, really obtained. And then uh, uh, this fungi, for, and then in this case, we, we, we try to really study the spore density and the root colonization are equally sensitive for host species specific because some, some presenters you have seen, you know, is they differ from species to species. And then there are a number of, you know, abiotic factors which also influence uh, their density and then uh, colonization. 
But I think oftentimes uh, there is a knowledge gap in this, in, this, in this topic because when you are really measuring soil health, oftentimes we go to soil chemical properties, soil physical properties, and then you use those two. And then oftentimes, you know, we under research the soil biology or that is just another you know, third interesting pillar of soil health in general. And then I'm so happy that if you brought this topic on board for us to discuss today. Next slide, please. Yes, and then in this, in this we have mitigated uh, uh, the arboricular mycorrhiza for density erode colonization in a disturbed forest gradient, and then also along you know elevational gradient. So these are just two papers that I will try to go through uh, quickly. Next slide, please. Yes, I think this is the first work we did in, in northern Ethiopia, which is a, a remnant a dry Afro mountain forest ecosystem. Stay, stay where you were. Slide above, please. Yes, and then just to give you from left to right, if you see, you know, it's a kind of a disturbance gradient by which, you know, the last, the, the extreme right one is where, where, you know, the forest is so much degraded. And then when you say forest degradation, it's also a loss of soil, you know, physically by erosion and then also in situ degradation of the soil. So, I think when, when you are disturbing the above ground, one way or the other, we are also disturbing the underground system in this case because they really uh, work together. So this is the paper, I put a link there that you can go and then read about the details of what we found there. So what we did is really we tried to compare how this disturbance gradient in a, a small forest remnant really is influencing uh, 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 microiza fungi. Next slide, please. Yes, I think this is just, you know, uh, it's a big summary of, you know, one of the results we found in this, in this case is that, you know, the plant community, which we found is a really degraded plant community. So that means when an area is degraded, you found a very typical species, which are indicators of that particular ecosystem degradation. So in that case, what we found is there is a significant decrease in root colonization and then density of Ibocrine mycorrhiza in a degraded uh, system because these areas are re receiving the same rainfall, the same climate, same soil and then history. And then the only thing which we think varies in that system is disturbance. And then along that you know, gradient, we can clearly see and then all statistically significant decline in, in, in root colonization and then spore density in a degradation. And then the typical thing is that you know, we need to really be careful about you know, what happens in above ground because it's also affecting the below ground and then the overall ecosystem health and function. So this is one of the results that I also invite you know, my audience to go and read about. So next slide, please. So this is the second uh, work again, and then that's also a link to the paper which was really published just last week, very fresh. And then, in this case, I think, you know, if, if you, it's a typical thing that if you come to in the highlands of Ethiopia, you find a very dark spots in, in, in Googlers or in satellite images, and then you may wonder what are these black spots? And then these black spots are oftentimes, you know, the, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox church remnants because in the churches, you don't cut trees, you keep them as much as possible. So if you look at just in the middle of all these three places, so you, see, you see one is red on the post and then in the middle, then you find those churches. Then around them, you find forest. And then when you go away from the church, you found a very degraded landscape or a converted land this time. So I found, we thought that these are really interesting, you know, biodiversity hotspots really to think of, you know, for restoration or to really understand what is happening in a natural system compared to, you know, human and, you know, changed land use systems. There was, a, you know, very interesting studies in terms of what happens in terms of biomass, in terms of biodiversity of tree and then, you know, species where there was really scant information about what happens also underground. So this is what we really studied in that area. And then we stratified the area in terms of, you know, in the highlands, in the middle elevation, and also on the lowlands to see how, how this is what's happening in a long elevational uh, gradient. Yeah, next slide, please. So I think the key results we found is that, you know, uh, uh, the microda density is really decreasing with, with decreasing elevation. And then, you know, one of the, the idea, the justification we have is that in the highlands, you find a lot of degradation, a lot of soil erosion. And then also the temperature is, could be very low, very cold sometimes. And then you don't have a well-developed deep soil 
uh, and then fertile soil systems in, in, in the highlands compared to the lowland area uh, forests, rimland forests. And then also, uh, it is also very species, species specific, as I said, and then most of the species which have a lot of biomass and you know, road systems and, and then crown systems like ficus species, they are largely found on, on the lowland. So it's a combination of species and then in general, it is the ecosystem. So this is also a very typical you know, process uh, we found in, in this uh, uh, kind of fragmented forest systems. However, the irrigation zone might be really interesting to take from the forests of this type to understand what happens in this kind of landscape. Particularly if you are also projecting what would happen if you are really restoring, you know, a degraded landscape or for, you know, agricultural landscape into some systems. I think this kind of benchmark sites could really help you to really validate models and then also really understand what we should really expect from, from this kind of, you know, interesting natural natural systems because oftentimes when you have a models when you run them they will give you your results but i think it is really important to have this kind of benchmark sites to have a long-term understanding in and what's happening in the future and then my last slide go next slide please so i i have i have i think key key conclusions is really the evidence applicable for all ecosystem restoration particularly i said also agricultural system biodiversity and climate that is really very important and then I should reiterate what Mr. Ibrahim said from UNCCD yesterday that no, I think cure is really better than, what did he say? Cure is better than remedy. So in that case, I think we need to be careful about some of the very key ecosystems. And then it is much cheaper and then also technically feasible to protect some ecosystems not to degrade and instead of degrading and then restoring. So restoration have some potential because now the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, I think restoration is becomes one of the very strong keyword coming up. However, we need to really be careful to keep the right balance because we need to avoid as much as possible degradation. We need to reduce degradation as much as possible. And then the last option could be you no know, restoration because it is costly. And then also sometimes there are a lot of uncertainties around that. And then of course, I'm not discouraging restoration because we have huge lands which are already degraded that needs our restoration attention, so to say. But this undegraded site, particularly in the highlands of Ethiopia and then places like Latin Africa are very few. And then I think they really require a kind of you know, conservation uh, attention, I would say. Yes, and then in terms of research, and then also I think more research is really required in this field because as I said from the beginning, and then it's a lot is about soil physical and chemical properties when you talk of soil health, and then I think the biological pillar need also critical attention. And then if you look at also the, the uh, atlas of bio soil biology, and then you see that you know, most of the disturbance on soil biology is happening where the hotspots of biodiversity is also existing. So in that case, I think we need to also be careful about to, you know, when it comes to conservation in this case. And then I think we need to have also enough evidence on, on the functions and values of, of uh, soil biology in general and then microbial fungi so that, you know, we could attract enough investment. And then during the plenary, if you have seen, I think there are so many people saying that, you know, the private sector and others would like to invest. However, we need to really value, holistically value the benefits of soil bio biodiversity. If you just look at it from biodiversity angle, you might get a certain you know, income or you know, positive return. If you look at it from land, you can add value. If you look at it from climate, you will add another value. I think oftentimes we are a little bit shy in terms of you know, quantifying the ecosystem services that we are having from this kind of investment. And then I think that is what I would like to really recommend. And then of course, the academia also need to pick this topic critically because we have so many masters and PhD students coming up and then I think they need to be, you know, courageous enough to pick up you know, soil biology as an important subject. And then with that, uh, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Petri. Um, a very interesting talk. Um, I think that's one of the most original uh, examples of an ecosystem services provided by churches, as you showed, <laughs> these nice black spots. We have a few minutes, I, let's improvise a little bit. We were cut from Mrs. Kathleen Schlavec and she has only one last summarizing slide to share with us. So I would propose Mrs. Schlavec that you 
try to show that slide so you can end your talk like you were prepared to end it. And as long as you're doing that, I think we have a minute for a question. Maybe any one of you can raise your hand if you have a question for Dr. Bitmaria. Okay, so can, can I talk now? I don't see. A, I don't need okay. to. So, I actually, it's it's a it's a bulleted summarizing slide, so I don't need to share it. I can just uh, convey it. I can tell you, and obviously everything is recorded, so people can look at it. So unfortunately, there was a power outage, and so that's Murphy's laws. But essentially, what I wanted to show you is that urban soils are also alive. There is a, a rich biota in urban systems. And so we need to study them and we need to uh, you know, discover what kind of ecosystem services they provide. They function very similarly uh, as in everywhere else. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that unfortunately our knowledge is very, um, very uneven. So where urbanization is taking place today is our areas, there's huge gaps where we don't have any information even on natural soil systems. So in, in, in Africa, South America, so different parts, a lot of our data come from temperate regions, very, con very restricted to temperate regions and mostly from Europe, actually, where there's a rich uh, tradition of, of soil biodiversity studies. And so there are huge gaps about that and where this is happening right now, losing soil biodiversity, we do not have uh, much information. The third point is that, uh, as I mentioned, this is the way to, this is one way to sort of reconnect people to nature. And so yesterday we heard that once people learn something, they start caring about it. And so I think this is important. And finally, in cities, I believe healthy soil is even more important uh, in, in terms of human health than anywhere else. And so therefore it's very important to sort of study and convey this information, bring together all the stakeholders, uh, urban planners, scientists, uh, uh, residents, uh, conservation organizations to sort of be on the same page about this and understand the importance so that we can create sustainable and healthy cities. So yeah. thanks for the opportunity to summarize. Thank you very this. much. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. It's nice to see also functions of soil biodiversity in urban environment because then they come so close that people can experience them. Yeah. Thank you very much for your contribution. And again, of course, also uh, Dr. Beta Marian, for, thank you very much for your contribution. I hope there will be questions you, uh, to you from the chat. And then we can go to the last uh, presentation of this session. And that presentation will be given by Ms. Christina Menta. And the title of her talk will be Soil Monitoring Using Arthropod Adaptation to Soil, the Case of QBS R Index. This is Menta, please the floor. Yes, I'm here. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Perfect, okay. We can start. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you to, to the organizer for this opportunity. Um, my presentation aims uh, uh, to address some aspects on soil biodiversity with, uh, with a particular focus on uh, uh, arthropods and earthworms in particular that uh, play key roles in maintaining soil health. And uh, in this uh, context, the safeguard of soil fauna fits into uh, the goal 15 uh, of the 2030 agenda. And uh, this is, in my opinion, a challenge, uh, a challenge that uh, we cannot ignore. And uh, as known, soil biodiversity exceeds uh, that uh, of other terrestrial systems by orders of magnitude, particularly at uh, the microbial scale, but not only. Also, soil invertebrates such as nematodes uh, can reach uh, high abundance, but uh, they remain significantly undervalued, despite their role in soil functioning and uh, the possibility that we use uh, these animals uh, for soil monitoring. We can quickly uh, define soil fauna in different ways, uh, considering uh, the size of animals, uh, the roles that these uh, animals play in the soil, and the time that uh, uh, they spend in the soil. And uh, these aspects are really, really important in the bioindication approach. Uh, soil zoosenosis comprises, comprises uh, invertebrates uh, recognized 
fundamental for soil functioning, such as earthworms involved in the increase of soil porosity or water regulation, organic matter, um, decomposition and translocation. Uh, but uh, the action of uh, the animals uh, in, is in relation of the weight and the time that uh, these uh, uh, animals spend in the soil. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, the distribution of soil fauna is uh, driven by several factors. Organic matter is one of the most important factors that uh, influence uh, generally positively the presence of many groups, but uh, also soil porosity, uh, pollution and uh, other features. And uh, in addiction, some groups uh, display a curious uh, aggregate behavior. We can find uh, uh, thousands of specimens in a site and uh, some uh, centimeter away, we can discover um, only few specimens. And uh, the rhizosphere is uh, an amazing world. Uh, the several substances released by the roots uh, attract bacteria, fungi, and consequently, many other organisms live in the microcosm, uh, finding a favorable environment in terms of organic matter, content, prey, or refuge. And uh, in agricultural ecosystems, uh, we can highlight some practices that uh, can that improve soil fauna diversity and vice versa, some authors that affect the soil living community negatively. Applying sustainable uh, soil management, we can act on the factor that drives soil fauna distribution. Adding manure or applying mulching, we increase organic matter available for soil fauna directly as food resources, but also increasing microflora, uh, microflora community. And the contamination can affect the soil animals negatively, but also compaction using EV tractor or machinery, destroying the pores where soil fauna lives. And tillage, tillage has generally a dramatic impact on soil invertebrates, but the effect depends on the depth and uh, uh, the plugin or, uh, on and the, the soil type that we have to consider. So uh, in the maintenance of uh, soil fauna diversity, uh, cover crops uh, avoiding the bare soil condition play, play a key role increasing biomass input to the soil. And the roots uh, of the plants reduce compaction uh, and the combination of no tillage and cover crops enhancing water availability crop productivity and the soil biodiversity. But uh, the positive effect of cover crops uh, depends uh, also on the species or consociation that uh, we consider. In this case, uh, in uh, a study submitted, uh, where we consider the effects of different uh, cover crops uh, or earthworms in particular, uh, the earthworms community, uh, you can see that uh, the abundance uh, and the dimension of uh, animals, the weight, uh, in terms of weight, uh, were significantly lower in the control, uh, no cover, but uh, comparing the four uh, covers uh, and consociation, there were differences between them. And uh, in uh, this study in, in carried out in northern of Italy, we evaluated soil arthropod uh, um, data in two farms, comparing conventional agriculture, tillage, and uh, conservation agriculture with the not tillage and the use, of, uh, uh, the use of cover. And in the bar chart, you can see that some crops, uh, such as wheat, for example, showed higher arthropod abundance in the conservation agriculture in the farm one. But uh, this result was not confirmed in the farm two. And uh, uh, this can depend on the different type of soil uh, or organic matter content on the use of irrigation. And uh, um, if uh, we consider the number of groups, uh, we obtain another suggestion. The number of groups uh, was higher in conservation agriculture and uh, this highlights the sustainable practices can improve biodiversity considerably. And when we focus on uh, specific groups of uh, invertebrates, uh, we can obtain different indication in relation uh, to the sensitive of group. The first chart uh, refers to mite abundance, uh, shows higher value in conservation agriculture compared to conventional for many crops, uh, but for the columbola, the results are not so clear, are not so evident, showing that the two groups uh, can give us uh, different information on the impact uh, of the two type uh, of uh, management. And uh, uh, in addition, different uh, stages uh, of the biological cycle can react uh, to soil management in a different way. In this feature, uh, we can observe 
the eye sensitivity to telogen earthworms, evident in both years of the test in the three, uh, in the three farms, um, where not till and cover crops show higher numbers of individuals when compared to tillage system. But in my opinion, more interesting information can be obtained considering different stages of biological cycles. As you can see in the second chart, in this case, the higher number of juveniles in uh, no tillage that uh, uh, suggests that the earthworm community is alive and uh, really healthy. And uh, let me introduce uh, the QBSR, my last part of my presentation. Uh, the QBSR is uh, an index developed at Parma University and uh, it is based on soil microarthropods. This index is based uh, on the, this concept that in a soil characterized by good health and a good quality in terms of soil organic matter content, structure, rhizosphere, and uh, so on, we can find more microarthropods adapted to soil. And the vulnerability of these animals in relation to their adaptation level of soil is the key concept on which this index is based. Soil perturbation doesn't allow the survival of these animals. And really briefly, QBS is based on the microarthropod community, separating using the ecomorphological approach in my. As you can see in this table, some groups are reported only one in my score no adaptation, or uh, five or 10 intermediate adaptation, or 20 maximum adaptation. But uh, other groups uh, reported a range of uh, EMI score, one five, one 10, one 10, 20. And uh, in this case, uh, in the, the reason of this case is that uh, we have different species uh, that show different level of adaptation to soil. And the QBS are, is the sum of the maximum EMI score for each, uh, for each group. And uh, we can use uh, this uh, first uh, approach. Uh, the, we can use the MI score for obtaining a first indication on the effect of different management in uh, uh, an agroecosystem. In this graph, in this graph, uh, you can see that conventional agriculture shows a percentage of groups lower than conservation agriculture with MI20. And when we consider only one graph, in particular, this is in relation to the columbola, to the sprinters, the bar graph of the right, we can see that the percentage of MI10 and 20 uh, maximum adaptation uh, to soil. Um, and the highest vulnerability is uh, even higher compared to conventional agriculture. So, and uh, mm, this index uh, has a proven ability to uh, show soil suffering levels uh, in terms of uh, soil degradation, compaction, or pollution, or uh, other traits. But uh, it can help uh, us uh, in highlighting soil restoration. Um, process or to develop sustainable techniques helping soil environment. In the first graph, different cover crops alone or, alone or in combination were applied and the results show differences in, term, in terms of soil outputs community and in particular QBSR. But in the other graph, you can see the restoration phase after uh, a catastrophic event. And the QBSR index uh, highlights evident differences between flooded and not flooded area. This is a study that we conducted in, uh, in India. And uh, uh, just the last uh, slide, quite recently we collected we collected uh, 40 international papers published uh, in which QBSR was applied. And uh, we identified eight categories considering land uses. We noticed that agricultural land and the soil affected by degradation show the lowest QBSR values, while grassland or orchard or wood highlight the highest um, index value. And uh, considering the consistent number of studies in which the QBSR was apply applied, we founded a working group inside the Italian Society of Soil Science uh, with the aims to collect the people that are applying this index, develop an um, application protocol standardized, organize training at produ and produce an uh, international and uh, national for Italy and international database. 
In this symposium, we presented the working group uh, and uh, we have some communications and posters that report in the application of the QBS in Italy, but not only. And uh, for information about this index, uh, please uh, contact me. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mrs. Menta. Thank you very much for this very impressive and interesting talk about soul microarthropods that are my pet animals. So I always like to talk about that. Very interesting results. Um, Thank you, Peter. There are always already questions to you coming in uh, through the chat. So please have a look at that. That applies to all the presenters. Questions are coming in through the chat and have a look at that. Um, we will come to the end of this session, but uh, we can leave the chat open for a short while. So if people still have some questions or comments, you can bring it in and presenters can give answers. But the moment we close the chat, it's over. So you can leave the session, of course, if you like, but we will keep it open a little bit, maybe for some additional questions. I would say it's close to four o'clock, but let's give room for anyone who likes to say something about uh, particular presentations or in general, there is now a moment to do so. In the meantime, we'll keep the chat open for particular questions to particular presenters. Is there anyone who want to raise her or his hand to say something? Well, I can say something about the forthcoming days. Um, I would like to have a question. I, if it's possible, Peter? Yes, of course, Natalia, please. Okay. So thank you very much to all the presenters. Indeed, it has been a very interesting session. Uh, and I have a question, a general question to all of you, and I, I would like to hear from you because we have seen very different approaches to understand the status of soil biodiversity, but also uh, practices that could enhance uh, soil biodiversity. So I would like to hear from you, uh, which is your proposal to be a scale up to restore soil biodiversity? What you think the international community can do to restore ecosystems, as it was said, to recover the services provided by soil biodiversity and to restore the community? So I would like to hear from all the speakers uh, what, what you think and what are your proposals. Thank you so much. Well, the words to the presenters, the speakers, um, any one of those who like to comment on this question. Mrs. Slavic. Please unmute uh, Mrs. Slavic. You can unmute yourself now. Thanks, sorry. Thank you. Well, so I can speak about the urban systems and I think it's it's not gonna be like one general, like global effort, maybe it can be, but these are issues that are really solved locally. And I think uh, what we have been seeing, of course, is that because of these cultural, economical, uh, financial, social differences of how people relate to, say, green, green spaces, what, what their favorite landscape type is and how they want to manage it. it. It's very different in different parts of the world. And so I think it's, we can promote, just as we did in this conference, the general um, a message of the importance of soil biodiversity and the various uh, ecosystem services, but essentially, because especially in urban system, it's the people who own the land, it's the people who manage the land, the parcels, the residents, the schools, the churches, the, and so th these are very different views politically, culturally. So I think a lot of it um, is, is sort of ground, ground up and ground level of work um, in, in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, am I correct, Dr. Betamarian, that you also like to say something? 
Yeah, thank you very much. And then I think it is a valid uh, question. And then so what, and then what do we need to do? I think if I take you back to the plenary, if you're there, and then if you look at also the interest of the private sector, for instance, to invest in soil biology in general, they picked like two of them, three of them, in fact, presented about agroforestry, for instance. So we need to really try to diversify our source of food, fiber, and then, and then all, all other ecosystem services. So we need to, as much as possible, reduce the monoculture kind of systems. Like for instance, if you have a very homogeneous cereal crops compared to you know, having few trees on that landscape, it matters to me. So I think we need to be as much as possible, as a rule of thumb, I would say, you know, the diverse activities, the diverse ecosystem we are really, you know, putting in place. I think that is really one way of really making a, a soil biodiversity working to me. So I think we need, and then also the other, you know, in my last slide, I said that we need to also value it properly because why is the value of, you know, the COVID case, it is related to our activities. In terms of disease burden on humans, it is biologically related again. That's some okay, of the hypothesis. So in that case, we need to make sure that we need to look at it in terms of from. Yes, thanks. Anyone else? Then I would like to, to thank you all very much. I hope you will stay with us the forthcoming days. We have still two very interesting days to come. We have a plenary about the status of the global soil biodiversity, but we also have a plenary about soil biodiversity on the global agenda. And in particular, it might be interesting of, for many of you to stay also at the end of the meeting where Mrs. Zoe Lindo also will give a reflection on this particular theme, uh, which will be one of the uh, last session of uh, the global symposium. So very well recommended to all of you. I've understood that this session was participated by more than 100 participants. So I think this is really a success. Um, sometimes it has advantages to have a virtual meeting like this. I also understood that the plenary of yesterday was attended by more than 5,000 participants, which is you new. Know, when we were organizing this meeting, we counted on five to 600 which is already a success to have all these people coming to Rome. Now, if, now we have about 10 times as much. So in terms of having the, the message abroad and to share all these interesting signs, I think uh, we, are, yeah, we are part of a very interesting and very uh, historical meeting. Uh, again, I also like to thank Julia and Natalia for making this all possible because there's a lot of work done before we could have this session, not only by having this session organized well, but also preparing the talks, getting everything done, arranged all on a virtual basis. So I think you did a very good job. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you all of you by Thank you, Peter. participating. The presenters in particular, hope you will stay with us. And with these words, I would like to close this session and also the chat. Bye. Thank you. Bye.